the Flavian dynasty was shattered. By the end of the first century, thanks to the Senate, the Roman Empire stood once again at the precipice of civil war. The senators were quick to start shilling for their own favorites to take over power, but having assassinated such a competent and beloved emperor, none such vermin would do. Indeed, there was only one man they could elevate that was both competent, respected, and not feared. Nerva, by then very old and childless. Suddenly burdened with the empire, Nerva sought to restore order by pleasing the petty senators, allowing them to desecrate the Domitian statues and squabble freely among themselves, as he set about simultaneously reducing taxes and keeping the plebs entertained, with the help of Domitian's administrative staff that is, even cancelling a tax the Jews had to pay so they wouldn't feel like revolting. But in his pursuit to please the senatorial parasites, he allowed Domitian's assassins to evade punishment, something Domitian's Praetorian Guard couldn't abide by. One night, the Praetorians invaded the Imperial Palace, slaughtered the local guards and ran a long-delayed massive purge on all of Domitian's assassins. Nerva was taken hostage during all this, but never harmed. In fact, they just let him go, and he thanked them afterwards. Everyone agreed a purge was needed, but old Nerva's days were counted either way. Nearing his death, Nerva cemented his reputation as the first of the five good emperors by performing the greatest action possible, adopting Trajan as his heir. The senators were quick to start bitching, being denied their chance to lobby for their favorite vermin to become emperor. All while Trajan governed Lower Germania, scaring the germs away with his mere presence. It was then that he received a messenger from Rome, bearing news of his adoption by Nerva. The messenger's name? Hadrian. They were second degree cousins, you see. Both descended from Roman colonists in Hispania, born in Italica, a city founded by Scipio Africanus himself to host his veterans. Trajan's own father had served beside Vespasian and Titus in Judea, while the young genius trained in Syria, and just like Caesar, instigated an aura of respect and reverence wherever he went. Once Hadrian's father died, his cousin Trajan, alongside a man named Atianus, took responsibility for Hadrian and his sister, raising them as the children he never had. For while Trajan did get married with a virtuous wife, he much enjoyed boy pussy instead. Hadrian, however, was so obsessed with Twinkas that he gained the title Greekling, embracing his duty as a Trojan descendant and civilizing all Twink Greekoids he found with his massive Roman dick. And while the Spaniard cousins traveled south, Nerva got so tired of dealing with the Senate's shit that he suffered a stroke. Being taken to his villa, he later developed a fever, dying shortly after. And as Trajan traversed the Limes Germanicus, having been informed of Nerva's death, he finished his border inspections and set off for Rome. It's often hard to realize the importance of the times one lives in, but while few knew it at the time, as Trajan entered Rome on foot, they were about to experience the height of Roman civilization. As Trajan approached the Senate, he was very respectful, emulating Augustus's benevolence to keep the treacherous senators in line, continuing Nerva's policy to placate them, including just as much bread and circuses for the masses. One of Trajan's countless skills was his ability to recognize talent, assembling the best of the best the Empire could offer, sending them to govern the provinces and legions with great autonomy. One such brilliant mind was Apollodorus of Damascus, the genius engineer he met while in Syria, whom Hadrian would always fangirl around, and Lucius Quietus, the civilized Berber prince, bringing both along with him wherever he went, including Dacia. As we'll remember, Decebalus, being a filthy barbarian, betrayed his word, using the funds and weapons given to him to fortify against the germs to instead fortify against the empire, rallying the local tribes against Rome. Trajan, of course, was revolted by this betrayal and asked the Senate permission to invade, which they unanimously did. But civilizing Dacia would prove to be a one-sided affair, for Trajan would have to defeat a people as well-armed as the legions, thanks to their iron mines, defending steep mountain forts built with stolen Roman technology, all while enjoying local terrain knowledge and a massive advantage in numbers. Trajan was about to fucking annihilate them. Having Apollodorus build a temporary bridge, Trajan crossed the Danube, invading with two legionary columns and meeting the Cablus's legions at Tapei. As he relentlessly slaughtered the barbarians, Jupiter sent a powerful storm onto the battlefield, terrifying the Dacians into a retreat. 
After returning to the Empire to pass the winter, the Cabalus charged out of nowhere, crossing the frozen Danube in a surprise attack, but the ice collapsed on them, submerging his army in the back, while Trajan quickly mobilized a vicious cavalry counterattack in the front, led by Lucius Quietus. Beaten back, and with Trajan's legions threatening to advance further, the Cabalus promptly surrendered. In his infinite mercy, Trajan allowed the Cabalus to remain as client king, only ceding some territory and promising to be loyal this time. As part of the treaty, the Dacians provided the resources for Apollodorus to build a huge permanent bridge across the Danube, which would remain the largest one ever built for a millennium, threatening the Dacians with an immediate imperial response, should they revolt. And of course he revolted again. Not even a year later he was already sacking Moesha again like the fucking barbarian he was. Utterly pissed, Trajan would invade again, starting the Third Dacian War, to make sure there wouldn't be a fourth. With the military skill born only once in age, Trajan, alongside Quietus, crushed all barbarian hordes in his way as he marched to the Dacian capital, laying siege to it. As he did so, a local barbarian betrayed the Cabalus, showing where the water supply of the capital was located. Trajan then cut it off, forcing them to surrender, as the Cabalus cowardly fled towards Sarmatia. Meanwhile, Trajan was informed by another Dacian traitor of where the Cabalus' gold deposits were, and with this massive gain at his hands, there was only one thing left to do. The Cabalus was later encircled by Trajan's cavalry, and, refusing to pay for his crimes against civilization, he killed himself to avoid capture. Dacia was then broken apart into subservient tribes, with its valuable mines annexed by the Empire. Trajan would then bring the Cabalus' severed head and right arm to Rome, throwing them at the Gamonian Stairs, where Sejanus had once been strangled and Vitellius beheaded. To celebrate the conquest of Dacia, Trajan held a majestic triumph, bringing to Rome 700 million sesterces worth of gold with him, and another 700 million more every single year from the new province. With these new riches, Trajan would benefit the empire as a whole, proclaiming 123 days of celebration in the Eternal City. After pleasing the plebs, he would have Apollodorus build him a great column to show how Dacia was conquered, Trajan's Column, then a forum for the patricians, Trajan's Forum, and a market for everyone, Trajan's Market, and a road for everyone as well, can you guess? Yes, Via Traiana. And when the client king of the Nabatians died, Trajan sent his legions to directly annex it, bringing civilization to Arabia by building a road connecting it to the Red Sea, going through Petra in its route. Yes, the parallels are only going to increase. For the next seven years, Trajan ensured the Roman peace, spending his off time exchanging letters with Pliny the Younger, a good friend of both Tacitus and Suetonius, and assigned the governorship of Bithynia. There, he attested to the emperor's wisdom and virtue, asking him advice on what to do about the Christians. Trajan's advice? Ignore them. For even among the Christ cooks of the future, Trajan would still be universally loved as a virtuous pagan. But while Trajan did everything in his power to make the Pax Romana true to its name, the barbarians of the Far East wouldn't allow him. As the king of the Parthians, in his arrogance, put his own nephew on the throne of Armenia. As the Roman Emperor, Trajan had an agreed right to veto this choice, but Vologosius ignored him. Betrayed a second time by barbarian treachery, Trajan gathered his legions once more, set on conquering Parthia once and for all. He first started with Armenia, quickly taking over the mountains, putting the king in prison, where he later died, and annexing Armenia as a Roman province, subjugating its surrounding areas as client states. As he did so, a Dacian revolt had broken out, forcing him to send the Syrian governor to go crush it, promoting Hadrian to govern Syria in his place. Only then, with Quietus on his side, he launched the invasion of Parthia, conquering city after city in a pincer move attack. As Trajan sailed down the Euphrates conquering cities, he stopped to build a monument, then conquered the Parthian capital, reaching the Persian Gulf and building a statue for himself to celebrate, deposing Vologosius and appointing his own client king for Parthia, annexing Mesopotamia as a new Roman province. It was the culmination of countless Roman legacies, from the early forefathers' conquest of Italy, to the Scipio's salting of Carthage, the late Republican subjugation of the Greekoids, to Caesar's conquest of Gaul, and his imperial successor's consolidation of the Empire. Trajan had brought the Empire to its greatest extent, from the North Sea to the Persian Gulf it stretched. The known world had been united under the Roman eagle, its legions invincible, their emperor almighty, his power unmatched, attained by divine right. 
the first emperor to ever live up to Augustus. No empire would ever again match Rome's glory. Forevermore, Trajan would be acclaimed as Optimus Princeps, the best emperor. It's all down here from here. What first got the ball rolling south were the Jews, having migrated to the other eastern provinces after their first revolt failed so spectacularly. Wherever the Jews went, they refused to convert to the Roman gods, being shunned away from society at large. Their resentment towards Roman rule culminated in Cyrene, with Lucuas, for he had a theory this Lucuas. The reason why the first Jewish war was lost, Lucuas argued, was that the Jews didn't kill anywhere near enough as many innocent civilians as they should have. And by the gods did he ever put that theory to the test. Proclaiming himself king of the Jews and inciting religious fervor in Cyrene, Lucuas threw another great Jewish revolt. It soon spread all over the east, with him using his forces to persecute and genocide as many civilized Roman civilians as he could. And I do mean genocide. 240,000 killed in Cyprus, 220,000 killed in Cyrene, and Jupiter only knows how many in the other provinces. And after slaughtering the severely outnumbered Roman garrisons, they had the dead's flesh cooked for meat, their skin used for belts, and the survivors thrown to wild beasts. Once the revolt spread to Mesopotamia itself, along with some cities still resisting being civilized and a Parthian revolt breaking out, Trajan was forced to turn his forces back. As he put down the troubles in Mesopotamia, he sent Lucius Quietus to save the eastern provinces from the Jews, cornering the rebels on Judea, where he crushed them so efficiently that the whole second Jewish war was named after his corrupted name. Back in the front lines, Trajan was dealing with the last pockets of resistance. After pondering the divine beauty of the desert sun a little too much, he suffered a heat stroke. As he was being taken back to Rome, he urged to write an official letter proclaiming Hadrian as his heir, but his worn down body gave out before he had a chance, dying after almost 20 years in power. And what 20 glorious years those were! Now, had Plotina been your standard Roman viper, this is where she would betray the emperor's wishes. But, as I've mentioned, she was a virtuous one. Keeping Trajan's death a secret, she had an actor mimic his weakened voice, proclaiming Hadrian as his heir, later signing the letter herself. Having led Rome to its greatest heights, from there on, every future emperor's ascension would be blessed with the words, Felicitur Augusto, Melior Traiano, may he be luckier than Augustus, and better than Trajan. As Hadrian read about his cousin's death, an unrivaled weight had been put upon him. If the gods would challenge him with living up to the likes of Trajan, then Hadrian, being acclaimed Imperator by his men, would embrace the task head-on. Being the fortunate position of governing Syria and all its legions, the senators couldn't bring themselves to bitch too much. They still hated him though. Why? You're asking the wrong questions. What would come to define Hadrian's rule was an immense love of civilization, combined with a deep hatred for barbarity. The result being a preference for highly trained legions, non-stop constructions, and consolidated borders, the last one being the first he tackled. For as glorious as Trajan's eastern conquests were, it was left to Hadrian to answer the big question. Was the Middle East worth civilizing? Oh no, gods fucking no. So instead of direct rule, Hadrian recalled Quietus with his legions, settling with having the new provinces made client kings, except those already integrated into the empire. They could stay, for now. But while the senators kept their vitriol mostly to themselves, one whom did bitch openly was Atianus. He just wouldn't shut up to Hadrian about needing to purge all of Trajan's former staff members, getting refused every time. So Atianus, directly opposing the emperor's orders, had the Praetorians murder four ex-consuls who previously served Trajan, including the former governor of Syria and Lucius Quietus. Once he learned of the murders, Hadrian was horrified, immediately kicking Atianus out of the Praetorian guard. But the damage was done, and so the centaurs began bitching without restraint. Ending treason trials and promising not to hurt them didn't please them. So Hadrian turned to the plebs, and to appease them for good, he had all state debts of the past 15 years pardoned, having the Praetorians burn the documents in public, making him even more popular than any Flavian. Speaking of whom, if Domitian was a micromanager, then Hadrian was a nanomanager. 
While Trajan left governance to his capable staff, Hadrian meddled with every single imperial affair, ensuring everything operated efficiently and justly. And to do so, he spent over half of his reign traveling through the provinces of the empire. First, he headed to the Rhine, disciplining them to prevent another one of their revolts, later having them prevent another Germanic incursion by upgrading the walls of the Lyme Germanicus. Which takes us to Britannia, where Hadrian headed north to deal with a recently crushed rebellion, and saw with his own eyes the monstrosities that there lived. Without hesitation, Hadrian ordered a massive wall built, to protect the citizens of Britannia from the horrors that now laid beyond the wall. He then went to Hispania, where he relaxed by hunting down animals and fucking some twinks, then went south to crush a Moorish rebellion, and then went to the east, there negotiating with the Parthians to stabilize the borders. And during his trips, he just kept building shit wherever he felt like. Everywhere, that is. And as he passed by, he renamed the Thracian city as Adrianople in his honor. Yet another thing for you to remember, pleb. That included reconstructions as well, therefore rebuilding Agrippa's pantheon in its current form, and moving the Colossus Solis to stay beside it. Along his trips through the east, he indulged the wildest dreams of every Greek twink he found, until he met the most beautiful of them all, Antinous, who possessed an ass of such quality that even Sporus would kill for it. In such a good mood would Antinous put Hadrian, that while in Greece, he allowed the Greek hordes to assemble themselves into a pan-Hellenic league led by Athens and Sparta, only for it to be broken apart by petty squabbling, as Hadrian both reassured Rome's authority over its client kings and indulged in the weird religion the Greeks had so shamefully copied from Troy. Afterward, he sailed for Judea, there seeking to restore Jerusalem as a proper civilized Roman city, renaming it Aelia Capitolina, in honor of both him and Jupiter, ordering a temple in his honor to be built, later banning the barbaric practice of circumcision, which all combined to really trigger the Jews. A lot. By then, Antinous had come to mean much to Hadrian. It was the truest form of love there was, that of a cum slut to their master. They even traveled to Egypt, visiting the pyramids and sphinx as a rich couple in love does. Nevertheless, Antinous was still beset with one great terror, fearing when Hadrian would abandon him for a woman. Little did he know that Hadrian wasn't bisexual, he detested woman, like his wife, but Antinous was still driven to depression over it, and as Hadrian was resting by the shore of the Nile, the dead corpse of Antinous floated nearby. The emperor was heartbroken. Drowned in sorrow, he secluded himself into absolute isolation, suffering waves of sadness, grief, and lots, lots of anger. Meanwhile, the Jews were at it again, about to throw yet another revolt. Led by the proclaimed Messiah Bar Kokhba, he promised to retake Judea, by any means necessary. He gathered his fanatical Jews, slaughtered the local Roman garrisons, and retook Jerusalem for themselves. When the local legions tried to restore peace, they were pushed back by half a million rebel Jews. Bar Kokhba purged Judea of all non-Jews, Romans and Christians alike, along with their wives and children. When news of the massacre reached the Emperor, Hadrian went mad. He sailed for Judea, followed by 12 legions, and started killing every single Jew he found. No mercy was shown, no quarter given. Hadrian would settle with nothing less than the complete destruction of Judea. May his bones be crushed. I already missed Josephus. 
but as history often teaches us, discounting your rage on the Jews can only get you so far. The truth was, after two decades ruling the empire, Hadrian had grown old and tired. His heart was kindled somewhat after an astrologer told him of a falling star, claiming it was proof of Antinous' divinity. He would from here on be worshipped as the god of twink beauty. But all came to a head when Hadrian finished the Temple of Venus, building it to please his hero, Apollodorus, asking him for criticism. But just after he did so, he died, leaving Hadrian with no heroes in this already loveless, familyless, friendless world he lived in. As death neared the emperor, Hadrian was consumed by the issue of succession. His only male relative old enough to take over was Fuscus, his nephew, guarded by Servianus, a barely civilized Iberian. But Fuscus had proven himself to be nothing but a hedonist degenerate, so Hadrian refused to make him his heir, for the good of the empire. But said good wasn't in the mind of the claimants, whom, in their rage, attempted to overthrow Hadrian, only to get absolutely trashed and sentenced to death. Before he died, Servianus threw an Iberian curse on Hadrian, dooming him to beg for death, but be unable to die. With their deaths, all hope to prevent another civil war seemed to be lost, which was when Hadrian met him. The great-great-great-nephew of Trajan, a young genius of a supremely gifted intellect, unparalleled virtue, and the fullest admiration for honor and duty, from that day on, Marcus became the solution to the emperor's problems. But not quite. While absolutely perfect in every way, Marcus was still too young. So to serve as a stopgap, Hadrian got a man named Lucius Caionus Commodus to adopt as his heir. Then he died of tuberculosis. Yup, leaving his son Lucius Verus behind as well. But no problem, cause Hadrian adopted one of the few virtuous senators still left, Titus Aurelius Antoninus, to take his place. It wasn't that simple. Hadrian offered the adoption, and Antoninus, wondering if he was worthy enough, needed a few days to consider. But he came around to it, the conditions for the adoption being that he would in turn adopt Marcus, then named Marcus Aurelius, whom was made to marry Antoninus's daughter Faustina, with whom, despite hating sex, he had 13 children with, fulfilling his duty as a husband. Antoninus was also made to adopt Lucius Varus as well, cause why not, he was a cool guy, as we'll see. And with the succession settled, Hadrian finally allowed himself to start dying. Such was his agony in his last days that he ordered several men to kill him, but so strong was the aura of respect he had built around him, his slaves just kept killing themselves to not disobey him. Antoninus then took care of him, getting rid of any knives Hadrian kept sneaking into the room, until the emperor, after so much begging, finally died, leaving Antoninus to continue the dynasty that would be named after him. And he did absolutely nothing for 23 years. Based. Well, he did order the deification of Hadrian against the Senate's wishes, gaining him the title Pious, the Dutiful. But things generally just happened around him. Like when the legions pushed north and built the Antonine Wall, slaves were given more rights, out of mercy, Roman representatives were sent to China through the Indian Ocean, all while he remained in Italy, never leaving it, not once. Oh, and that time when the new king of Parthia, Vologosius IV, reunited his shithole kingdom and threatened to invade. So Antoninus just sent him a letter, saying, encroachment on Roman territory would not be taken lightly, which was enough to make Vologosius back down. But having reached his late 70s, Antoninus, after cursing out to the Parthians for daring to disrupt Roman imperial order, succumbed to old age, dying in his bed, leaving the empire to the greatest Roman alive at the time him and his adoptive brother. The Nerva Antonine dynasty, so far, had been blessed with great emperors, and Marcus Aurelius was no exception. Unfortunately, in the first year of his reign, he would be faced with a monumental tragedy. Faustina, after birthing many kids, such as Lucilla, had given birth to twins, one of which died soon after birth. But that was not it. The real tragedy was that the youngest twin, a boy named Commodus, survived. The hard truth was that the greatness that defined the Trojans and early Romans had been fading for centuries, becoming ever rarer. More and more, great men gave birth to weak fools. 
Marcus Aurelius could feel the dark times were ahead for the Empire. From time immemorial, the patrician Aurelianus clan had been entrusted with the Cult of Sol, the solar god of victory. As the newest member of the clan, Marcus embraced his duty. Having been boosted through the Cursus Honorum by Hadrian, been taught by the wisest man of his time, and reading the works of Stoics such as Seneca, Marcus Aurelius grew to be by far the wisest emperor to have ever lived. After Antoninus's death, the Senate sought to betray Hadrian's last wishes, and proclaim only Marcus the Princeps, but he shunned their efforts, demanding that equal power was granted to Lucius, as had been wished by his adoptive grandfather. The senators, as always, relented, and thus, Marcus and Lucius became the first co-emperors to rule Rome. After just finishing a joint consulship, so that's neat. Next, the co-emperors had to deal with the ever-corrupting Praetorian Guard, drowning them with bribes, to Marcus's disgust. And once Vologasius heard Antoninus was dead, he went ahead with his invasion, ransacking the east, taking over Armenia, etc, etc. To counter their aggression, Marcus was forced to relocate several Danubian legions to the east, appointing Varus to lead them against Parthia. He then meandered around for about a year, arrived in Antioch, and began partying, playing, and fucking non-stop, while delegating highly skilled legates such as Pertinax and Avidius Cassius to crush the eastern barbarians in his name. Which they did, not only retaking Armenia with ease, but beating the Parthians all the way back to their capital and burning it to the ground. Vologasius then sued for peace with Varus, whom, after marrying Marcus's daughter Lucilla, demanded the annexation of portions of Armenia and Mesopotamia, naming himself Parthicus Mediacus Maximus. Both emperors then celebrated a triumph, Varus out of joy, and Marcus out of necessity. But hurt beyond belief, Vologasius called upon a terrible curse on the world, using his own eastern black magic to wish for the deaths of millions in a pitiful display of rage. The result was the Antonine Plague, a smallpox epidemic that would indeed kill millions of innocent Romans and soldiers alike. Another terrible consequence of the war was that now that the Danube was mostly demilitarized, the Germans saw their opportunity to strike. One of the biggest Germanic tribes were the Marcomanni, led by the barbarian king Balomar. Seeking to destroy civilization once and for all, Balomar promised to bring forth the chaos and destruction the Germans always desired uniting the tribes under a single Germanic confederation, including the Quadi, the Chadi, the migrating Yazigi nomads, and the evilest of them all, the Vandals. Starting the Marcomannic Wars, the Chadi invaded both provinces of Raetia and Germania Superior, getting beaten back by the Rhine legions. The Germans then focused on the Danube, invading Pannonia and also getting beaten back by the legions. The local governor even summoned the tribal leaders to answer for their aggression, being led by Balomar, they promised to leave the empire peacefully. The governor was persuaded to trust them, letting them go, and when he returned to governance, Balomar invaded again and killed him. If there is a lesson to be learned here, I already taught it. In the same year, the Vandals and Yazigis invaded Dacia, killing its governor and later pillaging Moesia. Call to action once more, both Marcus and Lucius prepared to march north and save the empire, only for Virus to contract the Antonine Plague and suddenly die. Marcus mourned his adoptive brother's death, taking responsibility for his family. For better or worse, Marcus was now the sole emperor. Leading the Roman response, Marcus liberated the provinces of Dacia and Moesia, but to his back, the Germans invaded again, using the Roman roads to ransack Pannonia all the way to the Balkans. It was through these roads that Balomar also invaded, overwhelming the legions with his hordes and taking over Noricum, pillaging his way south into Italy and laying siege to Aquileia. But being too uncivilized to possess any siege weapons, Aquileia held long enough for Marcus to march west, pushing Balomar back north. Marcus set pursuit, crossing the Danube and raining retaliation on the Germans so hard that both the Yazigis and Quadi broke off the confederation. At the same time, a Hispanic legate challenged a Germanic king to single combat, defeating him with ease, and kicking his entire tribe out of the coalition as well. And so, Marcus sang praises of Maximus, and made him one of his top legates. And then suddenly, the Quadi betrayed their word, rejoining the confederation, alongside the Yazigis. By that point, Marcus had reached the same conclusion Germanicus once did. Only the complete extermination of the Germanic hordes would ensure peace. His mind made up, Marcus sent all of his legates to purge the forests, including ones like Pescinius Niger and Clodius Albinus. And during the night, he put his philosophical brilliance to the paper, producing the Meditations, the ultimate guide for living a virtuous, stoic life. 
as the war raged, the gods joined on Rome's side, striking bolts on barbarians during sieges and starting rainstorms when the legions ran short on water. Getting beaten to a bloody pulp, both the Quadra and Yazigis surrendered to Marcus, real this time. And with this great victory at hand, the entire East rose in revolt. Yeah, remember Avidius Cassius? He had been in correspondence with the Empress, and with her melodramatic waning, it seemed like Marcus was about to die. Fearing a civil war, Avidius Cassius proclaimed himself emperor to prevent a power vacuum. Thing is, Marcus was still alive, but before he could do anything, the Senate declared his old friend an enemy of the state. Avidius Cassius was then murdered by one of his centurions, and Marcus refused to see the body. After crushing the last remnants of the Germanic hordes, it became clear the emperor was indeed nearing his death. Despite old and weak, Marcus saw that the purged German lands were annexed into the provinces of Marcomania and Sarmatia, and finally, it was time to revise his succession. Having called upon Maximus to his tent, he adopted him as his heir, and fearing the rise of incompetent emperors in the future, he entrusted Maximus to restore the Republic and cleanse Rome of the corruption that had crippled it long ago. As he went to inform Commodus of his choice, bitter and lusting for power, he had Marcus suffocated, killing his own father. He then lied about Marcus dying of natural causes, securing the support of the legions, except Maximus, and declaring himself the new emperor. The second century is often remembered as Rome's golden age. And yeah, it's thanks to Commodus why we are now saying goodbye to it. After ordering the death of Maximus and hearing that he escaped, Commodus ordered the death of his entire family back in Hispania. Right after, he ordered the abandonment of his father's conquests, letting the germs go without punishment so he could return Rome and be a hedonist degenerate. And that's exactly what he did, being such a shit emperor that he already began being conspired against. To counter this, Commodus ran a massive purge of the Senate. The good, competent senator still left, that is filling the senate with even more incompetent fools, spending his days making everyone's lives miserable, including Pertinax, Salvius Julianus, remember that last name, and a competent provincial governor named Septimius Severus. And Severus is not a man you make angry. And while the empire drowned in revolts, Commodus LARPed as Hercules Reborn, wielding a giant barbarian club to torture empty war veterans and crush midgets in the Colosseum. It was left to Pertinax to actually crush the revolts, alongside Piscinius Niger, the last one remaining being by Clodius Albinus in Britannia, but it was never resolved. To glorify his newly named senate, Commodus named 25 worthless men to serve as consuls in the same year, among them Septimius Severus, and he was not having it. And as yet another great fire broke out in Rome, Commodus was busy renaming the city as Colonia Lucia Enia Commodiana, the Romans as the Commodians, and every single month of the year named after his 12 self-given titles. Lucius, Aelius, Aurelius, Commodus, Augustus, Herculeus, Romanus, Exuperatorius, Amazonius, Invictus, Felix, Pius. And to celebrate, Commodus ordered the reenactment of the Battle of Zema on the Colosseum, but the Punic gladiators were well led, winning the match. Commodus then came down to congratulate the winner, whom then revealed himself as Maximus, vowing revenge for his emperor's and family's deaths. After failing to have Maximus die in the arena, he threatened his own nephew's life to his sister, forcing her to reveal another plot against him. After all his friends were killed, Maximus was imprisoned and set to fight Commodus in a match, being stabbed beforehand to ensure his death. Mortally wounded, Maximus was thrown into the Colosseum to fight Commodus, true emperor versus pathetic LARPer. Maximus quickly gained the advantage, despite increasingly losing consciousness. Commodus then attacked with a hidden dagger, being countered and stabbed to death with it. Having avenged his loved ones, Maximus relayed Marcus' wish to restore the Republic, then giving in to his injuries. As Lucilla arrived, it was too late. Maximus was dead. Rome's golden age has ended. Its best days forever gone. While the glory of the past may be lost, its memory will live on. For there once was a dream. A dream called Rome.